Hey, Nate. Yes, Sam. The other day I did this uh, cool little science experiment that you can do in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. You just take like a bowl of warm water and stretch a piece of saran wrap over the top of it. And as the water condenses on the bottom of the saran wrap, mm -hmm. if you look at it from different angles, you can see like cool colors and it's like shimmery and stuff. And that happens with my takeout food too, if there's a clear plastic lid on top of it. Right. But where does that color come from? I got a question about that. Welcome to another episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That. I'm Sam. I'm Nate. And this is a podcast and a video where we talk about a lot of the cool research that goes on here at the Penn State Everly College of Science. Yeah. And today we are talking to Lauren Zarzar, Assistant Professor of Chemistry here at Penn State. And she studies dynamic materials that sense and adapt to their surroundings. Right. We met Lauren at the Steidel building here on the University Park campus, and we talked to her about a uh, really cool accidental discovery that she made with regard to structural color. Yeah, let's check it out. So we're here in Steidel building on the Penn State University Park campus, and we're joined by Lauren Zarzar, who's an assistant professor of chemistry at Penn State. Uh, thanks for joining us, Lauren. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your research? Yes, so my research group is really interested in studying stimuli responsive materials. So thinking about how can we make materials that actually interact with their surroundings. So they're not static, but they can sense when there's changes in lighting conditions or changes in temperature changes in different uh, chemicals um, around the materials. So really thinking about how we make materials that are active and adaptive. In a way, we sort of stumbled upon some of our more recent projects. Almost accidentally, we were making uh, droplets, uh, oil droplets in water, and we happened to notice they had very striking iridescent color. Um, iridescent meaning you look at it from different angles and the materials look different colors. So that was really exciting to us to think about how do we control the properties, um, the chemistry and the uh, physical structure of a material to give it different colors and then how can we make that responsive and, and tune that as well. So is, is this kind of like one of those fancy cars that we see driving around town sometimes that look a different color when you look at it from a different angle? Yes, yeah, so that would be uh, an iridescent car, <laughs> right? Um, and so you may have also seen iridescence in materials like opals. So for instance, you have an opal ring and you look at it from different angles and you see sparkles of different colors. A lot of animals um, are iridescent. So butterflies, for instance, you look at their wings from different angles and they'll appear different. So um, this is a type of structural color. So iridescence, uh, that angle dependent color um, is often characterized Characterized by the the way the light, the incoming light, actually interacts with the physical structure of the material, rather than say an ink or a dye. Um, you know, so your blue jeans, for instance, they're always blue, no matter what angle you look at them, because they have dyes in them or pigments. Um, but something like an opal, it looks different from different angles, and it's because of the way the light interacts with the structure of the material. So where does color come from? Most of the materials that you see in your day-to-day -day lives, the color comes from the fact that there are dyes or pigments or inks um, in the material. And those are molecules that will selectively absorb specific wavelengths of light, right? So we know white light contains um, a whole range of wavelengths, and the visible uh, wavelengths range from about 400 to 700 nanometers. So specific molecule, like a specific dye, um, will absorb only certain wavelengths of light and the wavelengths that it does not absorb it will scatter and that's what you see. So those wavelengths kind of correspond to different colors of exactly. light. Exactly, right. And we see that with like rainbows and it, with a prism you see that light separated into those different colors mm -hmm. so that with a dye or a, or a pigment it's just reflecting a, a particular wavelength so we only see that color kind of reflected off that object? Correct. And no matter what angle you look at that object or no matter what angle you shine that white light at it, it will always absorb the same wavelengths. Therefore, the color you see also looks the same and it doesn't have any angle dependence. So how is that different than st structural color, which is this kind of, are those kind of the two main categories of color? Right. So for materials that have structural color, if you were to look at 
consider the actual material it's made out of. So if we look at a, an opal, for instance, um, they're made of silica, so it's basically glass, right? And we know glass is pretty much clear. So in terms of the actual material, it's a clear material, so it's not selectively absorbing wavelengths of light due to some dye or pigment in the material. Rather, what's happening is the light is interacting with structures inside the material. Um, usually, for structural color, there's some periodicity in the structure on the order of the wavelength of light. Um, so you can see this, for instance, in a thin film. Um, like a soap bubble and or or a oil layer of oil on water like on the pavement and you see these colors um, that would be from the fact that you have a very thin film of oil um, the thickness of that film is on the order of the wavelength of visible light and that causes interference and where you get destructive interference we don't see any color. Um, and where you get constructive interference, that's where you would end up seeing the different colors. So you mentioned that you were studying responsive materials. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did color actually come into play in your research? We sort of stumbled upon it accidentally, um, where we were making these oil droplets. Um, each oil droplet actually has two different oils in it. Um, and so you can have different configurations of the oil in the droplet. And we were making droplets where they had all had the same size and they all had the same shape. And we noticed when we looked at these just, just in a dish, you know, just under white light conditions, um, that we saw different colors being reflected from these simple oil droplets in water. And this was really surprising to us because the droplets were large on the order of 100 microns. So again, I guess to compare that to the wavelength of light, that's many orders of magnitude larger than the wavelength of light. So based on the traditional mechanisms of creating structural color, that was not even on our radar because the periodicity or the size scale of the material was so much larger than the wavelength of light. But yet the droplets had this iridescence which is characteristic of a structural color mechanism. So it was um, confusing and very interesting to us, why do these oil droplets have this structural color? Um, we've also noticed this effect in um, even simpler systems, just water condensed onto a surface. So if you just take a clear plastic film and you condense water on the bottom of it. So we often do this by taking a clear dish with warm water in the bottom, putting the lid on the dish, letting the water evaporate, and you get water condensing on the lid and you see these same reflected colors, um, which turns out to be the exact same mechanism. So we were seeing this effect in really simple materials but that had geometries that were many orders of magnitude larger than the wavelength of light. You see these iridescent colors in these droplets. How is that different from how, say, a rainbow is formed? You know, actually, we when we first saw it, that was one of the ideas we had was, well, maybe it's just the same way how a rainbow works. Um, and a rainbow is created by the fact that you have light refraction and dispersion in water droplets that are in the atmosphere. So this was our first thought. Uh, and we have come some collaborators that we've been working with um, at MIT. We went to them with this problem, and we thought, oh, this should be easy to model. It's just refraction and dispersion, and we'll understand what's going on. Um, so they ran that model, and we quickly realized that that was not at all to explain for the color separation that we saw. So if you just consider the effects that are causing rainbows, the color separation that you would expect to see, uh, meaning you know, the angular separation between the red, green, and blue, would be rather small. We see very large separation. Also, the order of the colors uh, would be different. So we have our normal red, green, blue order we expect for um, looking at a rainbow in the sky. But actually, the order in which we see um, is flipped in many of the samples that we were looking at. So there were a few clues that this was probably not really contributing. It's contributing, but it's not the main cause of the effect that we were seeing. So when you say you see bigger separations, does that mean the, the, the colors kind of don't blend into one another? They're more distinct? So um, if you were to 
think of the angles at which you're sending the red, the green, and the blue, right? So in a, in a rainbow, you're looking at this, these droplets from a very far distance. So even though you may only have a couple degrees of separation between the red, the green, and the blue, they look very separated because now you're very, very far away. Um, with these droplets, we see tens of degrees of separation between the red, the green, and the blue. So even though you might actually be very close to the sample, it has a very strong green, red, blue color. Um, you don't have to be very far away from it to actually see that color separation. So is this a brand new type of structural color? In the sense that it's a structural color caused by interference, you could say it's similar. I mean, all structural colors are caused by some sort of interference, but what's different about it is that it does not require any nanoscale periodicity. So when we think about the design of the surface to make structural color, what would you design? People would think of thin films, multi-layers of thin films. Um, trenches that are spaced on the order of the wavelength of light, like a diffraction grating, you know, like a, a CD or a, a DVD, right? Um, so you typically would think of, oh, I need some nanoscale periodicity to get this iridescent color. But here we show that, in fact, you don't, right? We're generating this iridescent color in simple droplets that are 100 microns. Um, and it's because the, of the way the light interacts with the material through this total internal reflection. Right? So if you have a droplet, like a, a concave droplet hemisphere, light can bounce around at that surface many times. Um, and it can also take many different trajectories. And so light that's undergone two or three or four different bounces at this interface, those different paths of light, they have different path lengths. That's what leads to the interface. Um, and you don't need this very precise nanoscale periodicity that you would normally think of. So I liken it to a sort of new design principle for surfaces or materials that can give structural color. And now that we know this, right, how can we rationally design surfaces to control light in new ways that we wouldn't have thought of before. So are there practical applications for this information? Again, in just our day-to-day -day lives, right, color is so important to how we interact with um, the materials around us. And so from that perspective, you could imagine paints or coatings, cosmetics, these sort of things, where we now have an ability to make this iridescent structural color. We can make them uh, on solid surfaces. We can make them in, in powders. So you could think of using it for that purpose. And this might replace, for instance, um, nanoparticles or nano features that you might have otherwise need to use in a coating. Um, and you can make this iridescent color with just microscale structures. Um, also, um, sensors, for instance, color metric sensors. So we, we can make this color in these uh, biphasic oil droplets, which we've done other research to show that the shape of these droplets is very sensitive to stimuli in the surrounding water. So if you can make the droplet shape which gives a specific color, you can make that shape sensitive to some analyte of interest. You may be able to use it for a very you know, low cost, low power, aqueous phase sensing mechanism. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. And then just for sort of fundamental optical exploration, if you want to control certain wavelengths of light in different ways and reflect them in different directions, right now we can design a new structure surface that allows us to control light in, in different ways that we weren't able to do before. So could you, could you just like 3D print a bunch of these kind of hemispheres on, on a surface to, to make something? Yes, yes, you definitely can. So. Uh, Penn State actually has a commercially available uh, multi-photon lithography system called the NanoScribe. Um, so Penn State has this equipment and we've actually used this to 3D print tiny domes on a surface and it gives the same effect. Um, not only can you use this sort of 3D printing to print domes or spherical surfaces, but you can also use it to print really arbitrary 3D polygons and all sorts of crazy shapes. So 
so we can really get creative in terms of the design of the surface and we're not limited to just the spherical surfaces created by surface tension in droplets. And then, is, are there aspects of the droplets that allow you to control the color? Well, the nice thing about liquids is that they're deformable. So if we want to create a surface that responds to different stimuli, changes its color, liquids are really nice because we have ways of controlling things like the contact angle of a liquid on a surface. Um, and so it's dynamic. If, if we're making the surfaces completely out of solids, we'll have to come up with different ways of making it responsive. Um, options are you could always use some sort of responsive polymer. Things like the refractive index contrast the interface, that could make a difference. So changing the specific um, materials that you're bringing together at the, at the interface might change things. We talked about it as a kind of new type of structural color. It's actually just newly explained. And this phenomenon has been around for, for forever, I guess. Um, you talked about that you can do this with a Petri dish in the lab. Is it something that people could do at home? Definitely. So actually, you know, in my own kitchen now, uh, when, I, when I see it, I'm like, oh, I, why have I never noticed this before? Um, but all you need is to condense water onto a clear plastic surface, although the plastic surface should be hydrophobic. So you could take, you know, a clear Tupperware lid or maybe some clear plastic wrap. You just want to make sure that whatever clear plastic surface you're using doesn't really like water. You know, you might see this effect if you have a warm plate of food and you put saran wrap over it, and, right, and you'll start to notice condensation of the water onto the saran wrap. Um, if you look very early on in the condensation, you'll be able to see some glitters of color. Um, the catch is that if you have droplets of all sorts of different sizes, even though each little droplet will be reflecting specific colors, the fact that you have lots of different sizes, now all of those colors are sort of mixing together when they reach your eye. So um, if you have too many sizes of droplets, it'll probably look glittery, silvery, uh, whitish color. You may not see like a brilliant blue or green, but uh, I bet you'll see some of these sparkles. Um, and, and now you'll know that it's from each little droplet of water that's condensing onto the plastic wrap. So that was cool. Yeah, and it's actually really interesting to see how many different ways that you can get color from just light. Right. In the intro, I kind of talked about structural color as if I knew what it was, but honestly, I had no idea that you could get these cool iridescent colors just from light kind of bouncing around inside of clear objects. Yeah, and Lauren did a really good job at explaining her research and the structural color. Right, and the fact that this phenomenon is so kind of ordinary, is something that you can see in everyday life, and yet it could lead to, you know, future discoveries and new technologies is really super cool. If you want to learn more about Lauren's research, we will have links to her uh, research in our show notes. Right, and we'll have links to uh, the Eberly College of Science website where you can find out about all the different types of research that we do here in the college. Well, Sam, we have another episode of the podcast in the books. Right, and the great thing is that you and I get to keep on learning about cool new science. And... If you're watching the video, you'll probably notice we have a cool new studio space. That's right. We are no longer stuck in a corner, and we're really stepping up our game here at Hey, I Got a Question About That. Yes, and we have many questions left to be answered. So if you haven't checked out our previous episode yet, be sure to go back and watch our episode with Jason Wright. And be sure to tune in for any future episodes. Right. So thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye. I need to get my face back under control. Do you want to go with the rainbow question now? Kind of. What was the rainbow question? We had some accidental science up in here. Once again, so much better than us. People want us. <laughs> <laughs> We're the stars of this show. <laughs> Nobody cares about the research. We might not even have jobs here anymore by the time this comes out. <laughs> More pep. <laughs> we like Dan TDM. Hey everyone! Oh, you gotta use that voice. All right. We're going to forget all this, but let's go for it. Certainly helped us better understand color, so. Yeah. My what? So I was just trying to figure out how I was going to do that and lost, totally lost it. Right. And you and I just get to keep on learning. Oh, no, no, no. Freaking choked <clears throat> my own spit. <laughs>
If you want to learn more about Lauren's research, Lauren's research, have you ever wondered if the Nittany Lion was a real thing?